Who could have seen this coming? That the rich white lady who pretended to be a Native American for a very long time, presumably to reap some kind of benefits, turns out to tokenize people of color and may actually be racist because several women of color have departed Elizabeth Warren's campaign because, well, they feel tokenized and it's a hostile work environment. But it's not just Elizabeth Warren. There's also some shade being thrown at Pete Buttigieg. Were you watching the the Iowa caucus night when the results didn't come in and Pete Buttigieg, for some reason, still gave his victory speech? Well, standing behind him was a row of black Pete Buttigieg supporters. Some of those supporters started complaining. They were ushered away from their friends, their multiracial friend group, to create a line of black supporters behind Buttigieg. Why? Pete Buttigieg has no support in the black community, community, and everyone thought this was his attempt at trying to make it look like he did. Lo and behold, Democrats are racist, and they treat people of color like tokens or objects to try and win an election. I can't say I'm surprised. Now, I, I, obviously, Pete Buttigieg wants to win, and this is what politicians do. They do this all the time. It's not new. Warren, on the other hand, well, she's a liar, and we know her history. But come on, take a look at some of the more radical leftists we've seen throughout, you know, Portland with these Antifa people. I swear, I have seen, I've seen in person these far leftists, uh, mostly upper class white people who live in, say, Seattle or Portland, wearing all black, yelling racial slurs at right wing protest, right wing, right wing activists, or however you want to describe it, because they were marching too. We've also seen the video of Antifa yelling racial slurs at you know, uh, police officers who happen to be not white. So I can't say I'm surprised by this story, but let's learn just how Elizabeth Warren is being accused of tokenizing. And I'll just put it this way, being racist, I guess. Politico reports, women of color bolt Warren's Nevada campaign in frustration. Complaints, comments, advice, and grievances were met with an earnest shake of the head and progressive buzzwords, but not much else. Let me tell you why. Do you think Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, or any of these people actually believe half the nonsense they spit out? Of course not. When Bernie Sanders got up on the debate stage in 2016 and said, white people don't know what it's like to be poor. Come on, who in their right mind thinks that? Most poor people in this country are white. They're just saying whatever it is was written down by the consultant to try and get those activist votes in the primary. Why? Because other progressive, typically white people with college degrees think the same thing. You ever see that video from Ami Horowitz where he goes around and asks people what they think about voter ID? It's, it's actually kind of a scary video. He goes to like Berkeley or something and he asks young college students, typically white ones, if voter ID is racist. And they all say yes, because in their racist little minds, they think that black people don't know how to get a driver's license or find the DMV. He then goes to a black neighborhood and just asks questions and they all look, look, look at him like he's nuts. He's like, do you know how to get an ID? And they're like, what, what do you mean? And he's like, do you have a driver's license? And they're like, yeah, who, who doesn't? Like, who doesn't have an ID? How do you get a job without an, without, an, without an ID? He asked some questions like, do you have the internet? And they're like, uh, what, why are you asking this? And he's like, I'm just, you know, people are saying. And then, and then this one guy, it's really funny. He's like, what do you mean? Like, even a 10-year-old kid's got the internet, man. You got it on your phone. But that's what you hear from these progressive activists. And that's why Elizabeth Warren says this, this garbage because all of these people live in their, you know, suburban, upper class college world where they never actually interact with any of these communities. So sure enough, then when Warren brings some of these people on and treats them like objects, they object to what she's doing. A half dozen women of color have departed Warren's Nevada campaign in the run up to the state's caucuses with complaints of a toxic work environment in which minorities felt tokenized and senior leadership was at loggerheads. The six staffers have left the roughly 70 person Nevada team since November during a critical stretch of the race. Three of them said they felt marginalized by the campaign, a situation they said didn't change or worsen after they took their concerns to their or worsened after they took their concerns to their superiors or to human resources staff. During the time I was employed with Nevada for Warren, there was definitely something wrong with the culture, said Megan Lewis, a field organizer who joined the campaign in May and departed in December. I filed a complaint with HR, but the follow-up I received left me feeling as though I needed to make myself smaller or change who I was to fit into the office culture. Another recently departed staffer, also a field organizer, granted anonymity because she feared reprisal echoed the sentiment. I felt like a problem, 
Like I was there to literally bring color into the space, but not the knowledge and voice that comes with it, she said in an interview. She added, we were routinely silenced and not given a meaningful chance on the campaign. Complaints, comments, advice, and grievances were met with an earnest shake of the head and progressive buzzwords, but not much else. A third former field organizer, who was also granted anonymity, said those descriptions matched her own experience. Here's the picture I see being painted. Faux wokeness. They're pretending to care about these issues. They don't actually care about these issues. And why would they? They're catering to an activist base on Twitter to try and get an activist vote. It's not working. As we saw, the New York Times has written numerous stories about this. The wokest candidates are the weakest. Gillibrand flopped. Warren's trying to play the game. Now she's flopping. Her own staff, exposed by Project Veritas, ragging on, on her, on Warren, for her faux wokeness and embracing these fringe far left ideological views that no one in their right mind cares about. Here's what I see. I see two potential things. It's entirely possible that some of these ca people campaigning for Warren are woke themselves and are demanding some kind of, you know, oppression or privilege, privilege, right? That because they're a minority woman of color, they should be allowed to speak. And maybe there's a clash here that the wokeness is treating Warren like she should step back and let them speak. Or it's entirely possible and much more likely, in my opinion, that Warren's racist. OK, I'm not going to act like she's an overt, you know, stereotypical racist going around spewing nonsense and hate. But I think it's fair to say, based on what was that? What was that law card that went viral where she wrote, writes down that she's Native American and she would do her hair that funny way? Come on, man. I don't think Warren is like a good... I don't know, a good representation of what we're, of what someone, <laughs> I think Warren, while not the most racist, certainly is racist. That, that's just my opinion. And look, she's floundering because of all of this. Let's read a little bit more. The three other women who recently left the campaign did not respond to requests for comment. One of the departed staffers declined to be interviewed because she feared professional consequences in, arena, in, in an, arena, an arena where it's already difficult for women, to, uh, women of color to advance according to another ex-Warren employee who spoke with her about the situation. The turmoil in Warren's Nevada operation comes ahead of the state's February 2020 caucuses. Nevada is important not only because of its early spot on the nominating calendar, but because it's the first chance for candidates to prove that their appeal extends beyond white voters who dominate the Democratic electorates in Iowa and New Hampshire. The problem in Warren's Nevada campaign heightened the importance of a rebound in New Hampshire after a third place finish in the Iowa caucuses. Of the first four voting states, Nevada is, Nevada is the one Warren has visited the least. She has spent just 12 days there, another factor that dispirited the state staff. This week, her campaign also scaled back its television ads in the state by about 140,000. I think we all know where this is going. Speculation running rampant. Warren is going to bow out and join Bernie as VP, most likely. The current data suggests that Bernie is going to win. We'll see. We'll see. Who thought Buttigieg was going to win? I think the forecast predictions are all wrong. All the polls were wrong. They were all wrong. And now Warren is scaling back ads. She's not appearing in Nevada, which she needs to. I think she's going to bow out, especially after this. Warren's campaign did not dispute the women's accounts, but suggested they do not reflect a broader problem within her large 31 state organization. Quote, we strive for an inclusive environment and work hard to learn and improve, Warren campaign spokesperson Kristen Orthman said in a statement. We have an organization of more than a thousand people, and whenever we hear concerns, we take them seriously. It's important that everyone who is part of our team has a voice and can be heard. That's why we are proud that we have a unionized staff and clear processes for issues to be addressed. I'm going to go ahead and say I'm not buying it, and I'll tell you why I'm not buying it. Let's take a look at who actually won Iowa? Well, now, I think it's fair to say Bernie Sanders won, at least by the popular vote. But the Democrats don't use a popular vote system. They use a delegate-based system, which is kind of like the Electoral College, not completely the same. But technically, if you win more rural areas, you will get slightly more delegates. That's why Pete Buttigieg has a couple more state delegate equivalents than Bernie Sanders. But here's the story from News One. Mayor Pete accused of using black women supporters as props at Iowa caucuses. Because when this weird thing happened, well, maybe we'll talk about it later, this weird thing of Pete Buttigieg giving a victory speech when no one knew what had happened, 
A lot of people are asking questions about that. You can see that standing behind him is a perfect row of black women. And then behind him, it's a more it's a mixed crowd. Look, man, I get it. You know, I, I'm not going to look at a crowd and judge you based on your race or your gender or any or, or even if you're wearing religious garb or anything like that. Not at all. But a lot of people pointed out that Pete Buttigieg was propping people up to serve as tokens. You don't need to do this. And it's so in my it's just so obvious what he's doing. First of all, the crowd isn't overtly white. You didn't need to create this row. But apparently I saw a tweet. One of these women claims that they, they told her to go there. So let's actually read this story. I have to scroll down because they really want to talk about the rest. It's like they don't want to get to the story, actually. But where, where are we at here? Here we go. They say, as Democratic candidates running for president were forced to wait until some, uh, some point on Tuesday to learn the results of the Iowa caucuses, Pete Buttigieg was already claiming victory. Weird, right? But it was how the mayor of South Bend, Indiana, claimed victory that caught most more people's attention than the fact that he was doing so without any election officials confirming who won. This guy uh, tweeted, I like Pete Buttigieg, but there's four black people in all of Iowa. And because of his problem getting black support since he announced his candidacy, he's got all four of them standing right behind him right now during his late night speech and rally. This uh, We have another person says, are we going to talk about the strategically placed black people behind Pete Buttigieg right now in Iowa or nah? Because it looks like a church group or sisters at a black hair salon or crab feed. That's all 3.4% of black folks in the state of Iowa. That's coming from, uh, that tweet is from a black, a black person. Reporters in the capital city of Des Moines noticed something that, that they said didn't feel familiar in the experience covering Mayor Pete's campaign. There were a group of black supporters seated prominently and strategically in the front row of a venue where the candidate who was polling the overall lowest with black people was giving his victory speech. It is so blatant that he was treating these people as an attempt at, politi- at, at, at politicking, as an advertisement, as a, a, a token or a tool of his campaign. And you don't need to do that. And you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't give speeches claiming you're winning before the results come in, because then people might accuse you of being a cheater, Pete. But I like to call him Buddha Jeb. Make sure you put the exclamation point at the end. You see that video where he's like, come on, because people wouldn't clap for him. Tonight, an improbable hope becomes an undeniable reality, Buddha Jeb told the crowd. Whatever. Twitter timelines instantly lit up with, sus- uh, with suspicions that Mayor Pete had planted black supporters for optics to push back on the narrative that he has no support within the black community. After all, in a state that is 90% white, where the mayor just last week admitted to the Washington Post that he was humbled by the challenge of connecting with black voters, the showing of black women supporters in that front row rightfully raised some eyebrows, considering that imagery has been absent from his campaign. How insane do you have to be to create a line? Just let people come in the crowd and let them do their thing. This person, Keith Boykin, says, out of the 100 or so supporters standing behind Pete Buttigieg right now, every single one of the black people seem to be strategically positioned directly behind Pete, so they'll all be in camera shot. South Bend advocate Gladys Muhammad, who is black, was one of the people in attendance and told the audience not to believe the hype. Gladys Muhammad is introducing Pete Buttigieg. I spoke with her ahead of her introduction earlier today, and she says she traveled to Iowa to show that blacks in South Bend do support Mayor Pete, including her. She's touting his involvement in the black community right now. We have another tweet. This is from Abby D. Phillip, South Bend Democratic Party Chair Gladys Muhammad. The national me- oh, so we just we just read that. Mayor Pete's traveling press secretary also pushed back hard on that narrative after one Washington Post reporter tweeted about his own skepticism over the black supporters' convenient placement in front of the cameras that showed viewers on a, on on TV a totally different perspective than the reality that were that, that they were swimming in a sea of otherwise white people. So Eric Fernandez says, Pete Buttigieg, quote, Pete Buttigieg polling at near zero with black people, campaign staff. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Maybe it was just a coincidence that there are five black women in the front row right behind Pete Buttigieg, and they got there early and got very good seats. I'm a bit more cynical than that, though. Nina Smith then said, and, uh, and, this, and this why the misconceptions about Pete linger. What about Miss Gladys and her story? What about the several black women I was, I was standing with? What is that? E-Y-E. The women behind Pete stood together as they have this entire campaign. And once again, their voice, their choice is erased, really. And you know, now, now it gets, you know, there's, there's no way to not be racist in this. Because either you're like, hey, that's strange that Pete Buttigieg did this. And even black people are pointing it out. But then other black people are saying, or at least his campaign are saying, that you're erasing their voice. I can't tell you, man, but I, come on. 
Does anyone, is anyone really going to believe that it wasn't strategic? Smith continued, the women behind Pete stood together, uh, their voices being erased. This person, Franklin Leonard, says, my compliments to, to whomever had the discipline to stage by count six young black women supporters directly behind Buttigieg for his Iowa caucuses speech tonight. The scene was reminiscent of the time when one Republican North Carolina rep, Mark Meadows, pulled out, uh, out uh, housing and urban development official Lynn Patton, a black woman, as a prop during Michael Hohen's congressional testimony as apparent proof that the president is not racist. Much like Monday night at the Pete Buttigieg event, the stunt didn't go over well either. There was a tweet I saw that I don't have pulled up where apparently someone said that they were asked to leave their group of friends. I don't know if that's true. Maybe it's just a rumor. But let me tell you something. In the political world, they do this. Pete Buttigieg's campaign is trying to complain, oh, it's racist to actually question his supporters. Come on, man. We know the game they're playing. Elizabeth Warren has staff who just quit because they felt like they were, they were being tokenized. And all that would happen is buzzwords would be spewed in their face. And doesn't that sound exactly like what most of us have experienced, especially with woke Twitter? Someone, you, you'll, you'll see like an anti, Antifa type person or a far left type person complaining about bigotry. And they'll just say a bunch of words that are meaningless. Buzzword, buzzword, buzzword. They'll call anyone who disagrees a bigot, far right, racist. The media does it all the time. So what do you think happens when people of color actually say, hey, man, like what you're doing is kind of offensive. They'll just spew the buzzwords they learned on Twitter back at those people and not actually address any of this. Now, look, I'm not going to play any games. Everybody accuses everybody else of being racist or otherwise. But I will tell you, it doesn't matter if Warren is or isn't racist or Buttigieg is or isn't racist. It's that this is how the machine works. The political system will absolutely prop up people because what they care about is getting votes. They will say whatever, whatever, whatever they have to say. They will accuse people of whatever they have to accuse. And they will hire the people of the right skin color and gender to make it seem like they deserve or I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah you should vote for them. Vote for me because I do these things. And they hire a big consulting company that analyze all this data to show them what they need to say. It's why Bernie Sanders flip flopped so heavily on immigration. It's why Bernie Sanders said white people don't know what it's like to be poor. It's why Kirsten Gillibrand did all that weird woke stuff and talked about white privilege. And it's why Elizabeth Warren talks about transgender children, because they're talking to marketing companies and pollsters who are saying this is what people want to hear. In reality, they could care less. I assure you, once they get in office, these things will become back burner issues and no one will bring them up ever again. Welcome to political season. I feel bad for these women who had to quit because, look, politics is a dirty, dirty game. And no one's going to actually treat you like an individual because they're looking at raw numbers. Maybe politics worked better 200 years ago when the population was substantially smaller and you actually, you know, even 300 years or further when communities were smaller and you were able to talk to people more directly to a certain degree. Today, look, we've got hundreds of millions of people in this country. Do you honestly believe that Warren's going to deal with your issues? She will tell you, she will whisper all the sweet nothings in your ear when you approach her and say, you know, I work at a school and this is happening. She'll, she'll say, I'm going to do right by you. You know what used to be easier back in the day? Yeah, have you seen that video where uh, Hillary Clinton puts on a Southern drawl? She was doing a campaign back in like 2016 in Alabama or Arkansas or something, and she had a little Southern twang to her voice. And the videos went viral because everyone knows she doesn't talk like that. Politicians used to be able to go down to these, these places before the advent of cell phone video. And Hillary Clinton, being a rather old person, probably played this game back in the day or saw it get played. So she thinks she can go to these communities and talk like them. Well, how about when Ocasio-Cortez put on a fake accent? Or I should say she used an accent because she probably, you know, has or had one. But she started talking a very specific way and people call her out for it. This is what politicians do. They go to your community. They pretend to support you to be a part of what you're a part of. And then once they get to their office, you don't matter anymore. But wait, when re-election's around the corner, all of a sudden you matter again. Yeah, because they want your vote. So you can get the, give, them the, give them the keys to the castle and then go sit in the ivory tower and laugh while drinking wine and ignoring you. I'll leave it there. Stick around. Next segment's coming up at 1 p.m. on this channel, and I will see you all then.